no, unfair dismissal doesn't only cover actual dismissals. Uh, it also covers situations where an employee has resigned, um, usually because of the way they say they've been treated by their employer. Um, the employer's actions uh, have to be serious and they have to amount to a fundamental breach of the employment contract, either express or implied. Uh, and indeed the employee mustn't wait too long before complaining about it and resigning. Uh, and this is what we call constructive dismissal. Sometimes the breach of contract can be very obvious, for example, because wages haven't been paid or because the employer hasn't complied with a, an express contractual term. But more commonly, the resignation is re in response to the employer's conduct or behaviour, often that a manager. Uh, constructive dismissal claims are not easy to prove because the breach of contract must be very serious. The employee also has to resign quickly in response to the breach. Every contract has a term implied into it that the employer must not act in a way which destroys the trust and confidence that an employee should have in them. And it's that term and behaviour that is commonly relied upon in constructive dismissal cases. Let's look at an example. This one highlights how breaches of trust and confidence can arise uh, but it also looks at the question of what happens if both the employee and the employer uh, are arguably in breach of contract. Does it prevent the employee from claiming constructive dismissal if he's also in the wrong? Do two wrongs make a right? And it's a perfect start to our talks today because it should really capture your attention. Why, Mary? Because it involves power, corruption and sex. <laughs> I don't think we're going to live up to that completely, but never mind. <laughs> Who needs Fifty Shades of Grey when you've got Mr Atkinson and the Community Gateway Association? Um, I hope he's not listening. Mr Atkinson was the association's director of resourcing. Um, and uh, it became apparent, at the beginning of this saga anyway, that there'd been a £1.8 million overspend. And at first he accepted responsibility for it, but then he tried to pass the buck on to others. So the chief executive had a quiet word with him and said, your position really is untenable. Uh, you can, of course, resign with a small package uh, or face disciplinary proceedings. Not really a good start, actually, by the employer, but it gets worse. Uh, Mr Atkinson declined the kind offer of the package and a disciplinary investigation began. While the investigation was underway, Gateway discovered <laughs> that Mr Atkinson was in a relationship with a lady working for another housing association and he was emailing her from his work account. In breach of the email policy, which funnily enough he wrote himself, a number of the emails contained quite graphic and sexually explicit messages to his partner, sent at times when he should have been concentrating on not running up that massive deficit. In other emails, he was divulging information about work matters, but he thought he'd been clever. He used the Windings font so that he was thinking that what he'd written couldn't be easily read. No flies on him then. They checked his emails and at one stage they found that he'd actually told his lady friend about a vacant post at Community Gateway, uh, that he was giving her tips as how she could prepare her application, what interview questions she would be asked, how she should make her presentation. He even suggested to a colleague on the panel uh, that she should be the one offered the job. There's nothing wrong with that, though, is there? Oh, no, no, absolutely nothing wrong with that at all, model of good practice. But um, uh, it did, in fact, work in that she was offered the job, um, but actually she turned it down, surprisingly. Uh, nonetheless, when it all came to light um, during the trawl of his emails, uh, it, it became the centrepiece of the allegations against him. Um, well, surprise, surprise, he then resigned in advance of the disciplinary hearing. Um, but he then claimed constructive dismissal uh, on the ground that by searching his personal emails, uh, Gateway had in invaded his privacy and that was a breach of the duty of trust and confidence. Mr Atkinson's claim failed in the Employment Tribunal. The Tribunal decided that his claim had no real prospects of success because he was himself in fundamental breach of the contract on the basis of the email exchanges with his lady friend. He appealed against that decision, and the Employment Appeal Tribunal, or EAT, uh, said that this was not the right approach. If there's a serious breach of contract by an employee, then the employer can react to that by taking disciplinary action, uh, 
And if the misconduct is serious enough, then that might dis warrant dismissal without notice. But if it doesn't do that, or it's unaware that a breach has occurred, then the working relationship continues. The breach by the employee doesn't have the effect of bringing the employment relationship to an end. If the employer then acts in a way which amounts to a constructive dismissal, then the earlier breach by the employee doesn't have any relevance to the question of whether the claim will or will not exceed, succeed, but it can be relevant to the question of how much compensation they're awarded. So this is the first practical message to take from the case. Even if your employee has committed a clear disciplinary offence, you still need to ensure that your treatment of him doesn't also amount to a breach of contract, because if it does, he may be able to get in first with a resignation, claim constructive dismissal before you've had a chance to dismiss him. Um, but, second practical point, let's go back to this question of whether the association had in fact breached their duty to him. Uh, Mr Atkinson argued that he was entitled to privacy and that they shouldn't have been looking at his emails. In fact, um, it was decided by the EAT that Mr Atkinson's emails had not been labelled private and personal, as recommended in the policy which he drafted, as Marie mentioned. He'd used this wingdings font to try to hide what he was doing, including the sexual content, uh, and that tended to suggest that he was aware that somebody might well read them, uh, and he was worried indeed that somebody might read them, so his constructive dismissal claim failed. As I mentioned earlier, an employee looking to claim constructive dismissal must resign quickly in response to the employer's breach. And the reason for that is that delay can be seen as waiving the breach, after which an employee can't do anything about it. But how long is too long? Well, in Chindove and William Morrison's supermarket, Mr Chindove worked as a warehouse operative. He suffered two incidents of alleged racial harassment and discrimination by a fellow employee, which he reported to senior management. The first incident wasn't investigated, or if it was, Mr Chindove wasn't told about it. With the second, he was told there was no evidence on which the manager could take any action. Mr Chindove was unhappy about this, and he escalated his grievance to a Mrs Atwell, who was the um, HR manager at head office. It took her nearly six months, yeah, six months, to investigate. Uh, Mr. Chinda, not untypically, went off with work-related stress. Uh, and to make matters worse, once he did receive her written report, it became patently obvious that she hadn't actually investigated his concerns properly at all. Uh, so he then turned to a special complaint, separate procedure, which was available to him, um, but six weeks later, frustrated by the lack of response, uh, he resigned and he brought his claim of constructive dismissal. The tribunal dismissed his claim. It said that the last breach of contract was Mrs Atwell's delay in dealing with the grievance. The six-week delay between that and the resignation was too long and suggested that he'd waived the breach. But the ATs actually reversed that decision. Uh, Mr Chindov had been off sick in the period leading up to his resignation with stress and in view of that and indeed his long service, six weeks was far too short a time from which to infer that he had decided to waive the employer's breach of contract. He was able to bring his claim. So what's the practical message here? Well, the context is very important. The decision to leave behind the security of employment will be a much more difficult for some people than others, especially someone who signed off sick with stress. If Mr Chindov had remained at work, doing his duties and uh, receiving his pay, then the outcome could have been very different. It's inconsistent to say that on the one hand, the employer's actions were so damaging that the working relationship uh, that had the effect of bringing it to an end, and yet, on the other hand, continue to carry on as normal and work and receive your salary. So whilst the delay of six weeks in this case could theoretically be fatal to the employee's ability to bring a constructive dismissal claim, um, it wasn't. There are exceptions to the general rule, and one of the big ones is if a person is off sick. Uh, and don't forget the last straw doctrine, uh, under which an employee's right to claim constructive dismissal can be revived by a later breach of contract by the employer. But let's remind ourselves of what this case also tells us, what it really tells us. Um, the practical point really is that if grievances are raised, uh, 
You've got to investigate them both thoroughly and promptly, not take six months and still have huge gaping holes in the investigation. So make sure you do it in accordance with your policies and your procedures. So let's now look at the fairness of a dismissal. As you know, there are five potentially fair reasons for dismissal. Uh, they are capability or qualifications, conduct, redundancy, breach of a statutory duty or restriction, and some other substantial reason, which you might have heard as referred to as SOSR. The last of these, uh, SOSR, is a sweep-up provision designed to catch potentially fair dismissals that don't fall neatly into any of the other categories. And employers often cite this as the reason for dismissal, where they've lost trust and confidence in an employee. But the next case is a reminder that you can't just use this category for any old reason you like. Whatever the underlying circumstances, the reason for dismissal must still be substantial and it must justify dismissal. So we've got the case of Z versus A. Um, Mr A was employed as a primary school caretaker. Um, the school was informed by the police <coughs> that an allegation had just been made that he had many years previously uh, sexually abused a child. And the accuser made a formal statement uh, confirming the allegations. The head teacher decided, understandably, to suspend Mr A, although he was concerned that the allegation might be malicious. After around a year, during which time the police investigations were still ongoing, Mr A was called to a meeting with the head teacher. He denied the allegations and said that he'd not been charged by the police. Nevertheless, the head teacher recommended to the school governors that Mr A should be dismissed due to the very serious nature of the allegation and on the ground that trust and confidence in him had broken down to the point where it was irreparable. Now, two days before that disciplinary hearing was due to be held, the head teacher contacted the investigating police officer again and was told categorically that none of the witness statements which had been taken by the police over that year, not one, supported the allegation and that therefore no charges were going to be brought against Mr Ray. But he was nevertheless dismissed. Although it wasn't suggested that he'd done anything to damage the trust and confidence in him, the school governors felt that the matter could seriously damage the confidence that parents and the public had in the school. So uh, the tribunal found the dismissal was unfair, and this was upheld by the EAT. The school's decision to dismiss was founded on a bare accusation which was unsupported by any authoritative evidence or opinion. This wasn't a substantial reason justifying dismissal of a person holding his position, and because of that, the dismissal was unfair. Right. Now, one of the most commonly cited reasons for dismissal is, of course, misconduct. And whilst an employer doesn't have to prove an employee's guilt uh, beyond reasonable doubt, that's the criminal test. He just has to show it on the balance of probabilities. They do no no nonetheless have to show that their belief was genuine, and based on the findings of a reasonable investigation. So what's a reasonable investigation? Well, we've had a very recent Court of Appeal decision which is unhelpful. Mr S worked as a floating support worker and used his own car to travel to see clients at their homes. And he was entitled to claim expenses for the mileage he travelled. He completed an online claim form giving the reading from his car, car's mileometer at the start and finish of each journey. An audit of his mileage claims over a three-month period showed that he'd claimed an unusually high mileage. The audit compared the mileage that he claimed against the distances for the journeys calculated by the AA route finder, and the mileage claim was consistently nearly twice as far as the distances, according to the AA website. So as part of the investigation, they also did a check of the mileage claimed against the same journeys the previous year, and the distances claimed had significantly increased in that respect as well. And they then looked at the distances given by the RAC website to compare them with the AA one, just as a double check. At the disciplinary hearing, Mr F gave Mr East, who was chairing the hearing, several explanations for the discrepancies. He said he had difficulty in parking, there were one-way road systems and roadworks causing closures or diversions. Mr S was questioned regarding two of the journeys in particular, 
Mr. East didn't think it was necessary to go through each and every journey with him because every journey was significantly above the mileage suggested by both the AA and the RAC. Mr. East didn't think that it was plausible that there was a legitimate explanation for each and every journey claimed. So he was sacked for gross misconduct, but he then claimed unfair dismissal. And he argued that Mr. East should have actually recreated every single one of the journeys in order to investigate his claims that roadworks and parking problems had genuinely increased his mileage on each time. Amazingly, the case got all the way to the Court of Appeal, primarily because Mr. S couldn't accept the previous findings that the dismissal was fair. And the Court of Appeal said that the investigation had been reasonable. The evidence that was collated on parking difficulties showed that based on his explanations, he would have had to have parked so far away from the client that it would have been closer for him to have walked from the office. <laughs> One-way systems were also taken into account by the route finders, and diversions could not have been the explanation for every mileage claim being significantly higher than it should have been. So it's actually quite a useful case. It's a common sense decision which emphasises that the employer does only have to carry out a reasonable investigation. Uh, you don't have to look at every minute detail being put forward. The samples investigated were clearly enough on their own, and you don't have to carry out a forensic examination. We also want to mention briefly uh, Uniquin, UK Limited and Western on the question of the conduct of appeals. Mr. Weston was employed as a shopping centre manager and on four bank holidays a year, a market was held in the supermarket car park. His job was to collect the rents from the storeholders. When the new employer conducted an audit, it found that there was £400 deducted from the storeholders without the supermarket's authority, £200 of which Mr. Weston had retained for himself without any deduction of tax or national insurance. He was dismissed for gross misconduct. His appeal was heard by a less senior manager than who'd held the disciplinary hearing, and he claimed unfair dismissal, and he won. In relation to the handling of the appeal, the employment judge found that this was a breach of the ACAS code of practice. Well, you might be relieved to hear that so far as that's concerned, the EAT overturned that decision. Uh, they said that the ACAS guidance uh, actually recognises that a small employer might not be able to find a more senior person within their organisation to hear an appeal. Uh, the most important thing is to give an appeal and to make sure that it is indeed impartial. Um, but having said that, and thinking about the situation most of you are in in this room, um, really uh, the ma major thing is that if you can find somebody senior, then you should. Uh, and it should also be somebody who has not been involved in any way, of course, with the subject matter. Um, unless you don't have sufficient management resources, you will be expected to provide an independent appeal with, an, with a senior person. Uh, but a tribunal won't penalise a smaller employer uh, simply because they don't have the resources available. OK, we just want to have a quick word about communicating the decision to dismiss. Um, in this next case, Robinson and Bowskill, uh, practising as Fairhill Medical Practice, the case was about whether a claim had been brought within the three-month time limit. But for your purposes, it's a reminder about when a dismissal actually takes effect. Mrs Robinson was summarily dismissed for gross misconduct. She was signed off sick during the investigations and disciplinary <coughs> process. Communications with her employer were via, via her solicitor. The practice informed Mrs Robinson's solicitor by an email on the 6th of July that she'd been dismissed. The solicitor told Mrs Robinson about her dismissal by telephone on the following day, the 7th of July, and then Mrs Robinson received a letter from her employer informing her of her dismissal on the 8th of July. Mrs Robinson presented her claims of unfair dismissal and discrimination on the 7th of October. The practice argued that her claims were out of time. So when did the dismissal take effect? Was it on the 6th of July when her employer had made the decision and told her solicitor? Or was it on the 7th of July when Mrs Robinson was told by her solicitor? Or was it on the 8th of July when she actually got and read the letter which confirmed her dismissal? 
Now, the solicitor thought that the date of termination was that last one, the date when the letter arrived. Um, however, they were wrong. Um, the correct date was the date when she first was told about it, which is the date they told her. Um, now, that was one day earlier. Her claim was out of time. I'm sure the solicitor's insurers had a right old laugh about that one. And it takes the pressure off Mrs Robinson too, because she's now got six years to sue her former solicitors. There's an obvious practical point here. Use genuine employment law solicitors who know what they're doing. Right. Uh, we're going to finish off now by looking at remedy. When an employer is found liable for unfair dismissal, a tribunal may award compensation, taking into account the losses that flow from the dismissal insofar as they are attributable to action taken by the employer. Now, in Countrywide Estate Agents and Turner, Mr Turner had responsibility, responsibility for several offices, and his salary was made up of basic plus bonuses, which included a percentage of the profit from those offices. He was then asked to take on responsibility for some extra offices, which were unfortunately failing offices, but he was assured that he wouldn't lose out financially. So he agreed and he signed a new contract accepting those revised responsibilities. Well, I think you guessed it. The offices turned out not to be quite as profitable and his bonus dropped, resulting in his take-home pay being much lower than before. Eventually, he resigned and he won his claim of unfair dismissal. He was awarded compensation, which was calculated by reference not to what he was earning at the time of his dismissal, but to what he would have been earning if he'd stayed where he was. And the employer appealed. And the EAT allowed the employer's appeal. They said that was correct. He'd entered into a new contract. His compensation had to be calculated on his earnings at the time of his dismissal. A little harsh, perhaps, but good news for the employer on this occasion. Even if you find yourself in a situation where a claim is going to go the wrong way against your business or organisation, it's not necessarily the end of the world. There are often arguments that we can successfully make to reduce the compensation that's awarded. Sometimes this can be quite significant. You might have heard us refer to polky reductions in the past. That's essentially where you can produce evidence that even if a fair process had been followed, the employee would ultimately have been dismissed in any event. And an example of how the tribunals apply this rule in practice, or rather in this case how they shouldn't, is Contract Bottling Limited and CAVE. Right. Contract Bottling Limited fell into financial difficulties, um, went into administration, were then bought out of administration, uh, and they needed to restore the company to profitability. So they were undertaking some measures to reduce overheads and that, of course, included a redundancy exercise. Um, and they were looking at the company's admin staff. Now, uh, there were 10 admin staff. They decided to put them all into the same redundancy pool, regardless of their different functions. And the pool of these 10 employees covered people with different skills from different departments, accounts, sales, quality control, and warehouse management. The employees were then compared using one redundancy selection matrix with a view to dismissing four staff and keeping six, retraining those six if needed. The claimants, Ms Cave, an accounts manager, and Ms McNaughton, an accounts administration supervisor, were dismissed, and an employment tribunal found that their dismissals were unfair. It assessed each claimant's compensatory award as one year's loss of earnings. When considering whether a polky deduction should be applied, the tribunal said that there was no evidence to suggest that had there been a fair and proper process, there was a percentage chance that either of them would still have been dismissed. Well, as is usually the case with these cases, because that's why they ended up in the law reports, the EAT thought otherwise. Um, there was actually plenty of evidence to suggest that these people might still have been dismissed if a proper procedure had been undertaken. Um, there was, first of all, a need in the first place to reduce numbers from 10 to 6. So there's obviously a chance that they being, of them being one of the four, or two of the four. There was evidence about the introduction of the accounting software, um, which in itself would have required a reduction in the accounting department, which is where they happen to be. Uh, that increased the risk that it might be them. On the other hand, 
uh, they actually had said that they might be prepared to take a lower salary. So that goes in the scales on the other side, um, indicates that perhaps they were less likely to be selected at the end of the day. So the starting point was four out of 10 were going to go. So there was a 40% chance that they would be selected even on a fair redundancy selection. So that suggests a 40% reduction for what we call polky purposes. But then it needed to be adjusted in both directions for the accounting software and their willingness to consider a cut. And at the end of the day, the EAT puts it all into the scales and they said there should have been one of these polky reductions in their compensation and the right percentage is 33%. So why are we going into this amount of detail on this one? It's simply in order to warn you that even if you have actually been challenged on the way you have calculated who should be made redundant and say you get contacted by ACAS under the new pre-claim conciliation process and you're told we've got an individual here who thinks that they were unfairly selected for redundancy but they're prepared to take a year's pay because that of course is the maximum compensatory award, um, you might well be thinking actually what are they really going to get? And so what you do is you actually have to look at these sort of factors. And of course, there are people who are very used to doing this. So the best advice is take advice. Unfair dismissal compensation can, be also uh, can also be reduced where whilst the dismissal was unfair on the facts, an employee is found to have contributed to their own dismissal or their conduct prior to the dismissal is such that it would be just and equitable to reduce it. In Frith Accountants Limited and Law, Mrs Law was 62 years old. Concerns were raised about her performance and in particular that she was becoming more and more careless. When refusing to accept that she'd made any mistakes, Mrs Law's conversation appeared to be rambling and incoherent. However, rather than raise performance issues with her, Mr Frith discussed them with her son. When she learnt of this, she resigned and brought a claim for constructive dismissal. Well, the tribunal upheld her claim. Uh, they said, yes, he might have had the best of intentions in speaking to the son, but she hadn't agreed to his doing that. Uh, his intentions might have been entirely genuine, but he'd breached the implied duty of trust and confidence, breached her confidentiality when he met her son without her permission and discussed her conduct, her performance, her behaviour, whether she was rambling, etc., etc. She was very upset about that. When deciding how much compensation to award Mrs Law, her employer then said, well, what about taking something off? Because she's not entirely blameless. She was underperforming, etc., etc. That's why these conversations were taking place. But the tribunal said no. Um, that didn't contribute to her dismissal. The reason why she resigned and was constructively dismissed was entirely down to you getting it wrong and speaking to her son, none of the rest of it. Uh, and they said, no, we're not going to make any reduction for contributory fault. The EAT said that the tribunal was right not to make any deduction because it was clear that in this case, Mrs Law's dismissal was entirely caused by the employer's breach of trust and confidence in having those discussions with her son, it wasn't because she'd refused to accept criticism.